Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the Mediterranean Machine Learning Summer School. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person this year. I was asked by the organizers to talk about the future of machine learning. Now that's a pretty tough assignment. I've been in the field for more than 30 years, but I really think that we're just at the beginning of the machine learning revolution. So rather than try and cover the whole of machine learning, what I thought I'd do is to pick one topic, which I believe will be one of the very exciting frontiers of machine learning in the coming years. And this really concerns the intersection of machine learning with the natural sciences. Now, this is more than just the application of machine learning to scientific data. In fact, I think it could be sufficiently different that it might potentially be viewed as a new paradigm for scientific discovery. I certainly think it will be one of the most exciting areas of machine learning uh, and also a very exciting area for the natural sciences over the coming decade. In fact, I've even pivoted my own career recently, standing down as lab director in order to hire and build a new global team in this space. Now, there's a lot of interest in uh, the intersection of machine learning and the natural sciences throughout the research community, but I'm going to illustrate this using examples from Microsoft Research. Uh, but first, I thought I'd just say a few words about my own background, which is actually originally is in, in physics. I studied physics as an undergraduate uh, at Oxford and then went to Edinburgh uh, and studied theoretical physics. I worked on quantum field theory. And uh, when I finished my PhD, I decided I wanted to move away from something very theoretical and abstract to something rather more practical uh, and with, uh, with potential for real world impact. And so I moved into the fusion program and I spent the next six or seven years working on the theoretical physics of magnetically confined plasmas. Now, it was around that time that Hinton and others published work on the use of gradient-based optimization methods to train early neural networks, so-called backpropagation. And uh, I, I thought this was a fascinating field. I bought this, uh, this famous historical book. It came with a disk in the back with some C code. Um, I taught myself to program, bought a workstation. And then I started to apply uh, these neural networks to uh, what was the big data of the day, data from large fusion experiments, such as this one in, in Oxfordshire. This is JET, the world's largest tokamak. You can just see a small person in the, in the photo there to give you some idea of the scale. Uh, and this offered rich opportunities for doing nonlinear data analysis using these early neural networks. Now, machine learning can be applied not just to fusion plasmas, but to a very broad range of uh, topics in, in the natural sciences. And you, here you see the, the huge range of the scientific world in terms of uh, length scales and, and time scales. Uh, and these different phenomena are all described by very simple differential equations, which describe these natural phenomena with, with exquisite precision over these vast uh, ranges of time and space. But there's a challenge. Although we know these equations, they're hard to solve. In fact, it was expressed very beautifully by the physicist Paul Dirac back in 1929. He said, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. It therefore becomes desirable that approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed, which can lead to an explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems without too much computation. And that really is uh, at the heart of what we're going to try to achieve with the use of machine learning in the natural sciences. Now, Jim Gray was uh, a Turing Award winner and uh, a Microsoft Technical Fellow who uh, rather sadly died in a boating accident some years ago. He talked about four paradigms of scientific discovery. So the first paradigm was the, the purely empirical. So uh, think, for example, of Kepler's laws of motion. Uh, planets move around the sun on an ellipse with the sun at a focus. And if you draw a line from the planet to the sun, then uh, because the planet uh, speeds up as it gets closer to the sun and it, uh, uh, it slows down as it gets further away, uh, then it turns out that the, uh, that line sweeps out equal areas in equal amounts of time. And that was an empirical discovery of a, of a regularity in nature. And there are many such regularities. Uh, however, this empirical approach on its own is really rather limited. It's difficult to, to do much in the way of generalization or to make new predictions. Uh, so that, uh, that was the first paradigm of scientific discovery, but progress really accelerated 
associated with the second paradigm, which is the theoretical paradigm. And, and that really is, is epitomized by uh, the discovery of Newton's laws of motion in the 17th century uh, or Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics in the 19th century. Uh, these equations are incredibly simple. You can put them on a T-shirt, um, uh, but sol solving them is extremely difficult. In fact, you can really only solve them with pencil and paper for some very, uh, very simple scenarios. And so it really was until the 20th century and the third paradigm of uh, scientific discovery, which is the computational approach. And this allowed for solution of those equations in much more complex situations. A nice example of this today would be large scale numerical weather prediction, which uses huge amounts of computation and can predict the weather extremely accurately for several days ahead. Now, these uh, solutions are computationally extremely expensive. In fact, uh, uh, the solution of scientific equations forms the major workloads for large scale supercomputers and so-called high performance computing. As we move into the 21st century, we then have a fourth paradigm of scientific discovery. And again, this is enabled by computation, but this time it's data intensive scientific discovery. So a good example of this would be the Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. Uh, and again, uh, the scale of this is extraordinary. If you look closely, you can just see a person standing at the, at the front of that image. Um, this gigantic machine is really a microscope for looking at the very smallest things that we can see in the universe. Uh, and it generates vast amounts of data. In fact, even after filtering out initial data, it's still producing data at the rate of 64 terabytes per second. Now, when you have such vast amounts of data, of course, machine learning can play a significant role. And so this is the, the fourth paradigm of data intensive scientific discovery. What I think we're seeing, though, is something which is rather like a, a fifth paradigm, and it's really the use of AI or machine learning to accelerate the simulation of those fundamental equations. Um, so this is not the use of machine learning on, on observational data, but rather machine learning applied to synthetic data, which itself is generated by simulation. And this is actually uh, very generic. The idea, however, is, is quite old and uh, it goes back a long way. And so I'm going to illustrate this with um, a project that I worked on something like 25 years ago, because I think it's a very simple illustration of the key idea. So this is uh, an application involving uh, fusion uh, experiments, uh, the tokamak in particular. Uh, so the tokamak is a kind of magnetic bottle. It holds a plasma at extremely high temperature, anywhere you know, between 10 million and 200 million degrees. And that plasma is uh, electrically conducting. It carries electrical currents and it's uh, contained in a magnetic bottle produced by gigantic uh, coils. Now, on one particular experiment called a compass, and you can see a, a photo of the interior of the compass tokamak during an actual shot, uh, this uh, experiment called compact assembly or compass was designed specifically to explore different cross-sectional shapes of that uh, toroidal plasma, uh, because by changing the cross-sectional shape, you could improve the efficiency. Um, and so here we see some uh, solutions, numerical solutions of the um, equations describing the shape of the plasma for different uh, different configurations uh, with a sort of circular configuration in the top left uh, and all the way down to this bean shaped configuration in the bottom right. So Compass really designed to explore these different different simulations. And we can compute these solutions by solving a particular partial differential equation. It's called the grad Shafanov equation. It's, it's seen here. And that equation is uh, a second order elliptic uh, PDE. Uh, which is solved by fitting it to boundary conditions. Now, the boundary conditions are measured experimentally by uh, dozens of very small magnetic sensor coils that are positioned around the, around the vacuum vessel close to the edge of the plasma. So what we're doing here is actually using the uh, results of simulation as training data in order to be able to speed up future calculations. So why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that really to address uh, a, a, an important challenge which is that uh, just solving for one of those configurations uh, 25 years ago would take a few minutes on a high-end workstation. And yet what we'd like to be able to do is real-time feedback control of the, of the plasma at a frequency of something like 50 kilohertz. And so real-time solution of the grad equations is about six orders of magnitude too slow. 
So the idea here is to generate thousands of solutions offline and then to train up a neural network. And then the train neural network, of, of course, can be very fast. At inference time, it's just a simple function. And so we have uh, this kind of uh, feedback control system. Uh, we have magnetic measurements from these little coils close to the edge of the plasma. Those are the inputs to the trained neural network. Uh, at the output of the neural network will be a set of real-time values for position and shape parameters of the plasma. Those are compared with desired values, which themselves may evolve over time. That, uh, that difference, the difference between those produces an error signal uh, that's sent to control amplifiers to change the current through those big coils that uh, can then manipulate the plasma. Uh, and by the way, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with a, uh, an excellent paper recently produced by DeepMind using reinforcement learning to control tokamak plasmas of this kind. Uh, in a sense, that's much more sophisticated. All that we were doing here was simple uh, linear so-called PID control, so a very simple linear fixed controller uh, with handcrafted coefficients, not learning how to do the control, simply learning how to do the shape reconstruction. And uh, here's an example from a, an early shot showing a programmed, in, in, in the dotted line there, a, a programmed uh, change, in this case, in the elongation of the plasma, together with experimental measurements. The, the solid line is uh, a very simple reconstruction obtained uh, shortly after the shot, and then the circles are more accurate reconstructions, um, showing that the uh, plasma can be uh, elongated through a series of steps using this, uh, using this neural network. Um, and because computers of the day were relatively slow, uh, in order to achieve uh, feedback control in real time, a dedicated neural network processor was built, and you can see the various modules here. So that was the very first uh, experimental uh, real-time feedback control of a tokamak plasma using, uh, using a neural network. So the fifth paradigm then um, should be contrasted to the fourth paradigm. In the fourth paradigm, we're using um, machine learning to train on observational or experimental data. In this fifth paradigm, instead we're training directly from a simulator. So the trained network acts as a fast emulator of the slow but accurate and general simulator. And so the challenge here is to produce an emulator which is not only much faster than the simulator, but which is accurate uh, and which also generalizes over a sufficiently broad range of, of situations. Now, from a machine learning point of view, this has a number of appealing advantages. First of all, the data, because it's obtained by simulation, is perfectly labeled. We can measure any quantity about the data that we wish. We also, uh, unlike, let's say, personal medical records, we don't have to worry about privacy and GDPR, GDPR issues. This is uh, synthetic data that we've generated directly. And then finally, the quantity of data, which is extremely important, of course, in machine learning, here is, uh, in a sense, unlimited, or more precisely, it's limited by our compute budget. We can always go away and generate more labeled data at any time. So we can use machine learning to accelerate uh, the solution, not just of the grad Shafanov equation, but a whole range of uh, partial and ordinary differential equations that are used throughout the sciences to describe uh, a broad range of different physical phenomena. And you can see some, some examples here. Now, any numerical solver or simulator uh, of the physical world has to satisfy uh, quite a lot of different uh, requirements. It obviously has to be sufficiently accurate. It has to maintain stability if we integrate over very long periods of time. We care about the speed at which it generates a solution. And of course, related to that is the, the computational cost of solving the equations. Uh, the solver needs to be easy to use because the user of the solver may be a domain expert and, and not, not a numerical simulation expert, and so the interface needs to be easy to understand. In many cases, we want to quantify the uncertainty in, in the solution. If we have some measure of uncertainty, um, then we can uh, use that in a variety of different ways. And of course, the, the solver has to generalize across a, a very broad range of initial conditions and boundary conditions and, and, and grid geometry and topology and, and, and so on. So it's really quite a demanding task to produce a good a numerical solver. Now, in the last few years, many people have applied machine learning to numerical solution of differential equations. Um, here are just a couple of examples drawn from the domain of uh, weather forecasting. Uh, the technique of Fourier neural operators have become very popular recently. Uh, and graph neural networks have also been widely used um, in this area. 
So what I'd like to show you now is uh, really an early look at some very exciting recent research from Microsoft Research in the use of machine learning to accelerate the solution of differential equations. And the motivation for this comes from noting that it's a pretty common practice to simply take the elements of any scalar and vector fields that, that might be present and just concatenate all of the elements and sort of treat them on an, an equal footing. And the problem with this is that it omits the geometrical relationships between these components, both, both within fields, within vector fields and between fields. Um, and so the question is, can we capture some additional inductive bias by leveraging the geometrical structure? And so here's a little example from fluid flows. On the left, you see um, the scalar pressure field uh, for some global weather model. And on the right, you see uh, the wind. And the wind, of course, is a vector field. And what you'll notice is there's a, clearly a correlation between these, not only between the components of the velocity in the vector field, but between the vector, uh, the wind vector field and the scalar pressure field. So this can be addressed by using a technique called a Clifford algebra. We can think of this as a generalization of the idea of a quaternion, uh, which in turn is really a generalization of the idea of, a, of a, a complex number. So quaternions and Clifford algebras involve multiple square roots of minus one, and these square roots of minus one don't commute under multiplication. So this allows us to generalize just scalar and vector fields to these multi-vector fields. So we can consider not only scalars and vectors, but uh, bivectors and trivectors and so on. So a good example of an application of this would be to the curl operator. So this is a differential operator that's widely used in, in differential equations. Um, it's really the, the cross product between the gradient operator and some vector field. And, and the cross product, is, uh, um, uh, as you probably know, is uh, although it's often expressed as a, a vector, it's really a second rank anti-symmetric tensor. So if you think about a, a three dimensional um, uh, three by three matrix that's anti-symmetric, it actually has only three independent components. The diagonal components must be, must be zero. And so it's common to take those three components and express them as a vector. Um, but actually, if you, make, uh, uh, if you make a mirror reflection, then uh, the, instead of reflecting the way that a vector would, it actually has a sign flip. And that's uh, really a sign that it's not really a vector, it's really this um, uh, second rank uh, tensor object. So we can use Clifford algebras, really we can apply this uh, framework to more or less any of the different techniques that are currently being used to accelerate differential equations. So we can apply them to the convolutional uh, and Fourier transform uh, operators uh, and, and, and many other techniques. So it's very broadly applicable. And uh, so this paper will be published um, in the very near future, probably by the time that you're watching this video. And I'll just give you a bit of a teaser, just some uh, results uh, from the paper. This is a fluid flow problem called shallow water. So this is a, a thin layer of fluid, which is bounded below by some fixed topography and has a free surface above. And you can see here the use of Clifford algebras um, in the left-hand column for a, a ResNet architecture and for a Fourier, Fourier neural operator in the right-hand column. The top row shows a full unrolled loss and the bottom row shows a, a one-step loss. And you'll see some really quite uh, dramatic reductions in error by moving to the Clifford algebra representation. So I want to turn now to another domain where machine learning is also having a big impact, which is to the modeling of molecules and materials. So uh, an example of this would be a so-called quantitative structure activity relationship modeling, which simply means we're given uh, a molecule, a potential drug candidate typically, and we want to know what its uh, properties will be. Now, one of the challenges with molecules compared, uh, compared to many other forms of data from the point of view of machine learning is that uh, molecules can vary in size. Uh, unlike an image, for example, uh, it doesn't have a fixed, a fixed size. So if we think about uh, image processing, uh, a very common technique, of course, is the convolutional neural network. So in, in, in a layer of such a network that the red node there takes information from a receptive field in the previous layer. We can think of that as the neighbors of that node in a graph. Um, and so successive layers apply successive transformations of that kind with, with nonlinearity in between, of course. Uh, and so we can generalize that to a graph structure. So here the, uh, the variables at the red node uh, are updated by taking information from the neighbors in the graph. So we can also think of that as a local message passing operation or a generalization of the convolution operation to um, uh, irregular graph structured data. Now, graph neural networks have been applied with a lot of success to modeling molecules. 
Uh, but of course, today, uh, attention mechanisms and transformers are proving to be very popular and uh, very powerful across a wide range of domains. And so it's fairly natural to ask whether we could improve the performance of graph neural networks by incorporating attention mechanisms. So this is the, uh, the simple self-attention self mechanism. The idea here is that the, uh, the, uh, the output of the transformation depends uh, on the input in a way which itself is data dependent. So it can pay more attention or less attention, that is say be influenced more or less by different inputs in a way that itself is data dependent. And that really arises because of this multiplicative uh, structure in the, in the basic self-attention mechanism. Now, self-attention in that simple form throws away important uh, uh, structural information. So, for example, if you think about uh, sequences, natural language in a natural language model, the sequence of the words is obviously critical in determining the meaning of the language. And so that information has to be incorporated in some way. And then likewise, if we're applying attention to image information, we need to incorporate the, the relative uh, spatial positions of the, of the pixels. So when we find the, the right kind of representation of that, that information in the case of graph structured data um, and apply that to the attention mechanism, then we obtain a new structure called a graph former. And so this incorporates three kinds of uh, encoding. There's topological encoding expressed, for example, as the, the shortest path between atoms in the molecule. Um, it incorporates uh, importance encoding, the relative importance of different atoms, for example, expressed through centrality. And then edge uh, encoding information is also included. And when we combine all those together, we obtain this graph former structure. Uh, one of the properties of the graph former is that conventional graph neural networks are special cases with reduced expressiveness. So this work was published in uh, NeurIPS last year, um, and also the code is available on GitHub. So the graph former has proved to be very effective in practice. Uh, this is a, a competition, the Open Graph Benchmark, Large Scale Challenge. And this is the molecular modeling track, uh, which in which the first prize was taken by a 12 layer graph former. And then this is a, another competition, the Open Catalyst Project. This is a large scale uh, catalyst discovery a uh, task proposed by uh, Facebook and CMU. And uh, again, first, pl first uh, place in the direct track. Uh, so this, this project, this uh, competition was actually motivated by applications in sustainability and climate change and just shows the, uh, the very exciting applicability of these ideas. So we've so far thought of molecules as static structures, but of course they're not at all static as the uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman uh, once said, uh, everything that living things can do can be understood in terms of the jiggling and wiggling of atoms. So uh, atoms, molecules are, are very dynamical, they move around. And being able to model uh, that, uh, that dynamical behavior can be very important. So modeling this, this thermal motion, this wiggling and jiggling of, of atoms is called molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, and in principle, at least, it's, uh, it's straightforward. So it usually begins by making what's called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So this notes that the, the protons and the neutrons which make up the nuclei of atoms are a couple of thousand times heavier than the electrons. And so the nuclei move around much more slowly than the electrons. Um, it's a bit like uh, um, thinking of a cow walking across the field and the cow is surrounded by a sort of swarm of buzzing flies. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the flies are moving very quickly, um, but the, as the cow walks slowly across the field, the, the swarm of flies moves with the, with the cow. And so the cow is a bit like the nucleus and the flies are a bit like the, the electrons. Um, and so we treat the nuclei uh, as classical particles. So each uh, nucleus uh, has a position xi and a velocity uh, vi, and it, it evolves through time according to Newton's second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration. Now the, the hard part here is computing the force. So the force is computed as the gradient of the total energy uh, relative to the coordinates of the, of the particular atom. Uh, that energy is quantum mechanical. That in principle has to be obtained by solving Schrodinger's equation. And that's extremely complex. And so it becomes important to find um, practical approximations to the solution of Schrodinger's equation to be able to compute that energy uh, and its gradients. 
Now, when we come to run uh, molecular dynamics simulation, we find that it's computationally extremely expensive. And there are actually three reasons for this. Um, and each of these three elements itself um, is open to um, a huge acceleration, potentially through the use of machine learning techniques. So each represents a very interesting research frontier. So the first challenge has to do with the accuracy of simulation. Uh, in many cases, we need highly accurate um, calculations in order to predict, uh, predict appropriate uh, properties. For example, if we're, if we're doing chemistry, uh, the energy changes involved in chemical reactions are relatively small compared to the total energy of the system. And so we have to compute energies with very high accuracy. So that's the first challenge. Um, the second challenge uh, has to do with what's called the, the curse of sequentiality, the fact that these, intrins uh, these are intrinsically um, sequential processes. I'll say more about that in a moment. And then the third is that we, of course, want to model potentially very large systems. Uh, biological systems in particular can have um, billions of atoms. And uh, ideally, we'd like to be able to scale up to those large systems. But again, that opposes a, a, a significant computational challenge. So let's just look at that uh, curse of sequentiality a little bit more closely. So this is a graph of uh, different time scales. And if we think about the, the jiggling and wiggling of atoms, uh, that really is occurring on a very fast time scale, a time scale of order 10 to the minus 15 seconds or one femtosecond. And so if we're going to track the, the jiggling and wiggling of individual atoms in the way that I described, then we need to make uh, time steps when we're integrating the Newton's second law of motion. We need to make time steps which are of the order of a femtosecond. And yet interesting phenomena occur on much larger timescales. And you can see some, some examples here, ion channels opening and closing on a, on a microsecond timescale or proteins folding on, on timescales of milliseconds or even much longer. And so this means we have to follow the wiggling and jiggling of atoms on a femtosecond timescale for um, very, very large numbers of time steps if we just directly simulate these important processes such as, uh, such as protein folding. And this is a problem because although computers have got a lot faster in recent years, that's almost entirely due to massive parallelism. So GPUs are fast because they do lots of things in parallel, but the, the intrinsic clock rate, the intrinsic uh, step rate of, uh, of processors really hasn't changed much in, in the last uh, decade or more. And, and these are intrinsically sequential processes. We have to complete one step before we can then go on and do, and do the next. And so that's called the curse of sequentiality. So uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, molecular dynamics simulation is extremely challenging, uh, it has had some important successes. I'm just going to show you one quite recent example. This was done by uh, colleagues in Microsoft Research in Beijing, where they modeled the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2. So that, of course, is the virus that causes COVID-19. What they discovered is an interesting phenomenon called the, the wedge effect uh, concerning the spike protein. Now, just as a, a little reminder, of course, a protein is a, 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 a linear sequence of amino acids, which then folds up into a three-dimensional structure. And the three-dimensional structure determines the, the function of the protein. Now, the, the three-dimensional structure is not a static thing. As, as Feynman indicated, it's jiggling and wiggling all the time. And, and it can actually adopt multiple different uh, conformations and can uh, spend a period of time jiggling in one conformation and then make a transition to a different one. And here, what was found is that the spike protein uh, has these two different conformations. So you can see here two parts of the, the spike protein, the RBD, the receptor binding domain, and the uh, NTD, the N-terminal domain. And the receptor binding domain is, uh, is, is key because it binds to the ACE2 receptor, and that's how the, the virus gets into a cell and, uh, and infects it. And so what was discovered is that there are these two um, uh, conformations, uh, one of them in which the um, the NTD uh, part of the protein uh, wedges and uh, keeps the RBD in an, uh, in an up position. The RBD wants to tilt downwards, but it's kept in the upper position by the NTD part of the protein. You see that on the left. But it can also adopt and can transition into this uh, open conformation in which the NTD moves away and that allows the RBD to tilt downwards. So that, of course, has some interesting uh, potential implications for the design of drugs to combat uh, COVID-19. So the way 
uh, the majority of drugs these days work, they're so-called small molecule drugs. Uh, they involve a receptor, which is a protein, which is the, the target for the drug. And then a ligand is a small molecule that binds with the, with the uh, receptor uh, in order to influence its behavior in some way. And, uh, and so the, uh, this interface between RBD and NTD on the uh, spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 looks like a potential uh, binding site for, for drugs, which could influence uh, the transition between those two states and therefore potentially prevent the, uh, the, the virus from, uh, from, from binding and therefore infecting a cell. Now, in principle, it would be possible to uh, try to design new drug molecules uh, specifically for this purpose. That's the conventional drug discovery pipeline that's it's time consuming and expensive. Um, uh, so as a, an initial uh, approach, uh, it's possible just to take existing compounds that are already approved by the uh, Federal Drug Administration or in, in clinical trials uh, for as drugs for other purposes and to see whether they combine to this, uh, to this site. And so that's a, a virtual screening using these simulations. And so here are the top four candidates uh, that potentially could bind um, in this way to the spike protein. And this work was published last year in advanced theory and simulations and, and made it onto the front cover. So very exciting work. So how can machine learning help to improve the efficiency of molecular dynamic simulations, which as we've seen are, are computationally extremely expensive? Uh, well, we note that in a, a conventional uh, molecular dynamic simulation, the, the simulator um, integrates Newton's law of motion using quantum mechanical forces in the way that I've described and produces the answer to the problem that we want to solve. Uh, but then next time we want to solve a different problem and it's the same code that runs, uh, that, that runs again. The code itself is, is unchanged. It doesn't uh, adapt, it doesn't learn from experience. And from a machine learning point of view, that feels like an opportunity. Can we produce a molecular dynamic simulator that actually improves um, each time it runs a different simulation. So the idea is uh, initially it would run as a, 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 in, in a conventional way, um, but then it could learn from the results of that simulation and then next time um, get better, uh, more efficient at doing the simulation, essentially by avoiding having to repeat detailed computations that are very similar to ones that have been done previously, because those computations can be used as training data to train up machine learning models. And so over time, such a, a combined simulator emulator should, uh, should improve its efficiency um, through, through this experience. So we can uh, introduce the terminology of simulators and emulators. So the conventional direct integration of the equations would be a simulator that uh, uh, can be very accurate. It's very general purpose, but it can be extremely slow. But if we run those simulations, we can use the resulting data to train neural network based emulators. And those emulators, once they're trained, uh, could be very fast because they're just running inference. So the simulation phase is computationally expensive. The training of large neural network models also, of course, is computationally expensive. But once this emulator is trained, it can now run new simulations um, very much faster than the original simulator. Now, um, of course, the emulator will be good at uh, uh, only at things that are rather similar to ones that it's seen during training. If it's asked to simulate very new situations, it may produce poor, uh, poor results. And so we could, um, provided we have an emulator that has some measure of its own uh, estimates of its own accuracy, we could uh, allow the emulator to continually improve over time using some form of active learning. So when the emulator realizes that it's making predictions with high uncertainty, it could go back to the simulator and request more training data. And, and this is the wonderful thing about this uh, paradigm, which is that the, uh, the simulator is always available to produce more data. The data is accurate, it's perfectly labeled, and there's an unlimited quantity of it or really only limited by compute. And so 
provided we use the emulator um, uh, many times, the cost of the uh, running the simulation, the cost of doing the machine learning training is amortized over many future runs. And so the, uh, the overall result is uh, potentially a very significant uh, improvement in efficiency, potentially by uh, many orders of magnitude. And that could be not just um, quantitatively better, but even qualitatively, because it could allow us to do kinds of simulations that would have just been computationally infeasible uh, without the use of machine learning. So I want to finish with one final topic, which is the potential development in the future of quantum computers, because this turns out to be very relevant. So if you've been following the, the popular press on quantum computing, you'll have probably formed the impression that they sort of solve all of humanity's problem. They have this, this incredibly broad applicability. Um, but actually, that turns out not to be the case. Uh, quantum computers will actually only be of, of relevance to uh, very specific kinds of problems, problems with very small scales of data and for which there exist algorithms leading to a, a super polynomial speed up relative to classical computers. Um, so one well-known example, of course, is Shaw's algorithm for factorizing the products of numbers, which is relevant to uh, breaking cryptography. Uh, but apart from that sort of niche application that will be of interest to, to certain people, um, the other uh, classes of problems where, where quantum computers will be useful uh, essentially have to do with the simulation of quantum systems. Um, but although this is a rather reduced uh, domain of applications, it turns out they are actually ones of, of enormous practical importance. Um, now, Microsoft has been pursuing the development of a quantum computer for a number of years, as have many uh, companies and startups and, uh, and academic research teams. Microsoft's taken a rather different approach to the development of a quantum computer uh, through a rather different choice of the, of the uh, physics used to create the fundamental unit of the, of the quantum computer, the qubit. So one of the ch big challenges with building a quantum computer is that the qubits are extremely fragile. They can easily uh, decohere and lose their, their quantum information. And a practical quantum computer will actually need uh, millions of, of these qubits. And the only way of achieving um, sufficiently stable qubits is through a form of error correction. So in order to achieve millions of uh, logical qubits, it will be necessary to build machines with uh, much larger hundreds or, or thousands of um, physical qubits to represent each um, logical quantum bit used in the computation. And so Microsoft's approach is based on a, a qubit that is a, a, of a topological character. Um, it's based on some physics uh, first uh, hypothesized back in 1937 uh, called uh, Majorana fermions. These are fermions. A fermion is a thing like an electron, uh, but a, a, an electron has an antiparticle, the, the positron, uh, which is a different particle. But a, but a Majorana fermion is its own antiparticle. And, uh, and so we can think of these uh, Majorana um, uh, quasi particles as really they're really collective modes of electrons that can be potentially created inside a, a semiconductor material at very low temperatures. Now, although this uh, physics was uh, was uh, hypothesized uh, many, many decades ago, nearly a century ago, it's only very recently, just in the last year or so, that uh, the, the ability to create these in the laboratory has been demonstrated. And so this is an important step towards building a practical quantum computer based on topological qubits. And the advantage of the topological uh, form of qubit is that it should be a lot more robust than other forms of qubits and therefore allow much lower degrees of uh, error correction and therefore allow a practical quantum computer to be built using fewer, maybe significantly fewer physical qubits. And so it simplifies the, the challenge of building a practical machine. But of course, building a practical quantum computer is still not easy. There are many challenges to overcome. There are the quantum materials themselves that instantiate the, the qubits. Uh, all of this lives in a, a dilution refrigerator at a, a few thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. And so all of the control logic has to live inside that uh, cryostat. And so new kinds of cryogenic uh, control uh, um, classical um, uh, computation has to be developed. And, uh, and then all of this needs quantum software to run it. So there are many challenges ahead uh, in order to produce a practical quantum computer. Uh, but when we have such a, a quantum computer, it could have a very disruptive effect on the simulation of the properties of, of molecules and materials.
So we can understand that better by looking at the, the so-called Jacobs ladder of computational chemistry. So this shows the trade-off between uh, computational cost and accuracy of different ways of approximating the solution of a, of a quantum mechanical system. So solving um, Schrodinger's equation, um, exactly Schrodinger's equation describes the, the, the properties of electrons and solving that exactly would be exponentially costly in the number of electrons. And so over the years, people have developed a whole range of different approximation schemes um, which trade off cost and accuracy. So you can see here at the bottom left, we have some very simple sort of force field type models, just handcrafted classical force fields, all the way through density functional theory, which seems to be something of a sweet spot at the moment on this on this curve. It's, it's an enormously important field. Uh, and then going on to coupled cluster models and various different kinds of configuration interaction approximations, uh, leading some some very expensive techniques that produce very accurate solutions. So the role of, quant of quantum computing here is not um, uh, so much directly in improving speed, but rather improving accuracy. So it will make it feasible to achieve very high levels of accuracy without the extreme computational cost. And so the role of quantum computing in modeling, uh, in modeling um, uh, molecules and materials uh, in a sense is complementary to that of machine learning. It's machine learning that will produce uh, multiple orders of magnitude um, uh, improvement in, in computational speed, but really the role of quantum computing will be to improve uh, accuracy, potentially again by some orders of magnitude. And this will have very widespread uh, implications because everything around us is made of molecules, it's made of uh, configurations of atoms, and, uh, and so there are just uh, almost limitless applications. And some of the most exciting and some of the most important will be to do with sustainability, to do with uh, clean energy and to do with addressing climate change. So many of us are very excited by this emerging frontier, the intersection of machine learning with the natural sciences. And in Microsoft Research, we're now forming a new team called AI for Science. Uh, this is a, a global team. We currently have research hubs in Cambridge, UK, uh, in Amsterdam and in Beijing and uh, potentially in other locations in the future. And I just wanted to finish with a, a rather exciting piece of uh, news, which is uh, concerning our research hub in Amsterdam. Uh, we've just announced that we'll be moving early next year into this new building that's currently under construction. This is called Matrix One. It's a to the University of Amsterdam and we'll be occupying the top floor of this building so that's very exciting. So uh, in conclusion then um, many of us see AI for science as potentially one of the most exciting frontiers not only of machine learning but also actually an exciting frontier for the natural sciences and the the next decade could well see many very uh, very impressive and potentially very impactful developments. Uh, one way to think about this is in terms of a fifth paradigm of scientific discovery, uh, complementing those first four paradigms, in which the role of machine learning is to provide very efficient emulators which can accelerate the solution of uh, conventional scientific simulators. Uh, the, the whole field at some stage will be disrupted yet again by quantum computing. Quantum computing will play a complementary role to machine learning. The main impact of quantum computing will be to improve the accuracy of our ability to simulate quantum systems. And then finally, and perhaps most exciting of all, is that all this wonderful science is directly relevant to some of the most important challenges that we face as a society in fields such as healthcare and sustainability and in addressing the all important challenge of climate change. Thank you very much.